Uh, but it's primary, as far as our purposes go, it has, uh, we, we need to first of all delineate between yoga as a school of philosophy. One of the six orthodox schools of Indian philosophy is the yoga philosophy, and uh, that as propounded by Patanjali. Which it's based on Sankhya philosophy, but uh, expanded and furthered. So this one of the formal schools of philosophy. We're not going to be talking about yoga in that aspect. The other uh, meaning of the, uh, the other main division is yoga as a process and as a goal uh, of spiritual life. And there also we have two uh, different derivations of the word, and without getting too technical here, uh, the one gets, uh, is one derivation uh, gives us the meaning of concentration, perfect concentration of mind, yoga as concentration. And the other derivation gives us the meaning of union or to unite, uh, which is primarily the approach we take in Vedanta. In, in the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali uses this uh, first meaning of concentration. Yoga is perfect concentration of, of the mind. And the, the, the very beginning of the Yoga Sutras, he defines yoga as what? Perfect concentration. <laughs> Chitta vritti nirodha. <laughs> the complete cessation of all waves in the mind stuff, that the perfect calmness of mind, perfect concentration of mind. And uh, yet we can see how these two meanings are related um, as one uh, with perfect concentration, uh, one, the mind becomes united with the object of concentration. Uh, in yoga, when perfect concentration is attained, the individual soul attains union with the Supreme. Uh, regains or remembers or realizes its true nature as one with infinite consciousness and bliss. So uh, that we have both these uh, ideas of yoga, concentration and union. And then we can find so many different expressions of what yoga is. Bhagavad Gita, for instance, two just came to mind. Uh, Karmasu kaushalam, yoga, karmasu kaushalam. Yoga is that skill in action, that dexterity in action. When one knows how to work perfectly, how to act perfectly, that's, that itself is called yoga by Sri Krishna. And elsewhere he says, uh, samatvam yoga uchate, uh, um, that equanimity of mind, the perfect equanimity of mind is called yoga. So this is a little bit on the traditional, the, the, the traditional roots of the word yoga. Now for Vivekananda, I think he brought in a new uh, understanding of yoga as a process for realizing one's true, one's divinity, and gave us these four yogas, as he called them, four approaches in spiritual life to realizing our divinity. And we can see how they, they appeal and address different aspects of our personality. We have in us uh, an emotional side. We have in us a rational side. Uh, we have in us a will which wants to do, wants to act. We also have a need for uh, quiet, for personal time, for contemplation. So these four aspects of our personality are addressed in the four yogas. We have the yoga of devotion, which addresses the affective uh, faculty, our emotional, our emotions in bhakti yoga are concentrated, purified, and directed towards the divine. And this becomes a path towards realizing our divinity. Then in jnana yoga, our cognitive faculties, our uh, reasoning, our thinking, pow our power of thinking deeply, these, this power is focused and concentrated and directed towards realizing our divinity. In 
Raja Yoga, the yoga of meditation, that same, uh, th that uh, our actually also employs our will, our, as they call it, the cognitive faculty, the faculty of will directing the mind to intense concentration and contemplation in order to realize our divinity, to remember our divinity, as it were. And finally, uh, our active, our desire to act, to do, that desire is concentrated and purified in the path of karma yoga uh, to realize our divinity. Now, Swami Vivekananda presents these as four separate yogas, and yet he himself says the greatest yogi, the greatest seeker, is one who can harmonize all four of these in her or his life. And because we all have these different faculties in us. But naturally, some of us will be more drawn to one, and some of us more drawn to another of these approaches. So these are the four yogas. As, uh, and, and in Swamiji's idea, ultimately, we strive for a synthesis of these four in our lives, a harmony of all four. Yet, uh, when this was another thing about Swami Vivekananda, when he was teaching something, he would put his whole mind into it and teach it as if this were the end and all and the whole thing and the whole complete story. So when he's teaching karma yoga, it's fully karma yoga. And karma yoga is the path and the way and the goal. Uh, when he's teaching bhakti yoga, bhakti is the, the path and the way and the goal. So elsewhere, maybe he's, he's harmonizing them. But he often, uh, we feel when we're reading that this is this is it. <laughs> this, is, this is the thing. And uh, he um, also, we should note that um, in traditional Vedanta, karma yoga was always considered uh, a preliminary practice for purification of mind. But that uh, the real practice is either jnana yoga or for the, the Vishishtadvaitans, bhakti yoga. That so that uh, karma yoga was not considered as a viable path of, its, of itself to realization. Swami Vivekananda has ma maintained that it is a viable path. It is a true, it is a direct path to realization. So that's a unique contribution of Swami Vivekananda to the tradition. So, uh, I, I think the best thing to do next will be to actually go into the text. And he will introduce the word karma. And he first talks about how all our actions uh, leave, uh, have effects. And they have two kinds of effects, of course. The effects, external effects, we call the, the fruits of our labors. Um, I mm, chop some vegetables and put them in the pan. and. Mm, mm, put on the fire, and what, what do I get? I get a meal. This is the external. But there's also the internal effects of karma. We call them the samskaras, the, the tendencies in our minds. And every action uh, plants a seed, as it were, uh, which um, gives us a, uh, a tendency towards either repeating that action, if it led to something nice, like a good meal, or avoiding that action, if it led to something unpleasant or painful. Uh, so if we put our hands in the fire and it, we burn our hands, that's laying also a seed uh, against putting our hands in the fire. So this is how uh, our action actually has tremendous influence on our minds, on our character. And this is the, the, the tack that Vivekananda will take first in this first class on Karma Yoga. <coughs> Now, I need to also uh, share uh, an interesting and important uh, thing about the book Karma Yoga. The book Karma Yoga, as we know it now in the complete works of Swami Vivekananda, or published separately as a book, is a book of eight classes delivered in New York by Swami Vivekananda in December of 1895 and January of 1896. And he gave eight classes. Four classes were classes for beginners. 
and four classes were classes for advanced students. Though I have a feeling that people would come to both of them. <laughs> he had, a, he had a, a, a fairly large core of sincere followers of these classes. Apparently, there were 70 to 120 people showing up for these classes. And he was teaching, at the same time, karma yoga, jnana yoga, and bhakti yoga uh, in this December, January, 1895, 1896. And, but the way they are published in the complete works is not the way, not the order in which they were delivered. Uh, and for whatever reason, the editor, uh, Ellen Waldo, m decided, Swami Vivekananda gave her the authority to edit and publish the, the classes, so uh, she did. And uh, it, they end up in a, in a different order. Uh, in our study of Karma Yoga, we're going to take some inspiration from Mary Louise Burke and follow the original order in which he gave the classes, starting with uh, the four classes for beginners in order, one, two, three, four, then the four classes for advanced students in order, one, two, three, four. And so that, that order will go like this. The first class for beginners is karma in its effect on character. Then what is duty, then we help ourselves, and then the ideal of karma yoga. And then the four advanced classes, each is great in his own place, the secret of work, non-attachment is complete self-abnegation, and freedom. Uh, now, I also want to just think us back for a moment to 1895 in New York City. Swami Vivekananda had arrived in this country in 1893 and had Done, uh, uh, was a, a, the cyclonic monk, a whirlwind of lecturing and traveling all over, and, and had been to Europe. And then uh, he got tired of that. And he felt it was time now to give more intense, uh, in-depth teachings to a group of students, uh, to really train them in Vedanta, and to guide them to realization. A single lecture is not going to, it, it is, it was important that he gave all these lectures to establish the basic ideas of the divinity of our, the soul and um, the goal of life, the harmony of religions, all these ideas. Uh, and uh, yet he felt called now to train up some disciples individually and in, in small groups. So he went to Thousand Island Park in June, from June to August of 1895. He gathered uh, a group of some 16, uh, 12, or 12 to 15 dis disciples and spent several weeks with them just pouring his heart uh, into their hearts and, and guiding them and teaching them. And those classes, we have a, a very incomplete record in the very powerful work, Inspired Talks. Uh, after that, he went to Europe. France and then England, and came back to New York City on Friday, December 6, 1895, after a harrowing journey in which he was quite seasick. For the first time, he had bad seasickness the whole, the whole trip. There were, the seas were quite rough. And he arrived in New York, and the temperature was 27 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, <laughs> he, uh, uh, lodging had been rented for him at 228 West 39th Street in a lodging house. This is one of those brownstones which, of which New York is famous, and it was full of them. And it was on the first floor, uh, I means not the ground floor, but the, the next floor up. Uh, and there were two uh, long rooms, two parlors, which were connected in the middle. And this was, this was it. It was just two rooms. The kitchen was downstairs. The bathroom was upstairs. And the b kitchen and bathroom were both shared. Uh, and it was to these humble lodgings that dozens and dozens of seekers flocked to hear Swami Vivekananda uh, teach. And I'd like to just read a little bit from Mary Louise Burke, who uh, paints the picture for us. The two parlor rooms that Swamiji's friends had engaged were on the first floor, running front to back alongside a narrow hall and opening onto one another, as parlors in those days generally did. The front windows, tall and narrow, faced north onto the street, and it was they, presumably, that provided most of the light, for the back parlor 
could have had, at best, only a side window that looked onto an air well. There was neither private bath nor kitchen connected with the rooms. They were simply rooms. You know, we think today how, how we expect a certain minimum thing, and the, such kind of, the minimum thing that we expect at least is there should be a bathroom, right? We, we have a, if, we, if we rent rooms in a house or somewhere, we expect at least we'll have a, a private bathroom in our apartment. No, Swamiji was just had a room. There was a shared kitchen below and a, and a um, shared bathroom upstairs. Um, it was to this unremarkable lodging house that Swamiji, clad in a red and flowing Hindu cloak, came on the morning of December 6. So uh, pretty soon, he, he didn't find the cooking arrangement. Uh, uh, Leon Landsberg, who had been initiated and became Swami Kripananda, was cooking for him. But the, somehow, it, it was not suiting him. And he asked Ellen Waldo to cook for him. And she did. She coming every morning. She'd get there early in the morning, and she'd stay till late at night, and then go home to Brooklyn, where she lived. And the next day, she'd come again. And so for her, it was a great blessing to cook for Swamiji. And for Swamiji, he got actual food. So <laughs> good, 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 healthy food. So the, the, the task of cooking fell on Sarah Ellen Waldo. Mm. Uh, Swamiji had said to her, the food here seems so unclean. Would it be possible for you to cook for me? And she was delighted to do that. She got permission from the landlady uh, of the place. And uh, now something else extremely important happened in Swami Vivekananda's mission right at this time, which is the arrival on the scene of Hosea J. Goodwin, Swamiji's stenographer. Before that, there were some stenographers who attempted to record Vivekananda's classes and lectures, but no one with the skill and ability of Goodwin. So Goodwin, uh, they, they put, placed one advertisement in the newspaper, and Goodwin appeared. And it's almost by divine uh, arrangement, because this is when Swamiji started, really started in earnest his teachings of the yogas and all that, and Goodwin arrived on the scene. And he was an expert stenographer, and he also had the smarts to understand what Swamiji was saying. And he became a disciple, a devoted disciple and follower, and followed Swamiji to India afterwards, and actually left his body in India. So uh, Goodwin would take, in t with full concentration, take down as much as possible every word that Swami Vivekananda would speak. And then he would type it all in his uh, the, the, after that, he would type it all down, make a typescript with uh, carbon paper, I'm sure. So there would be several copies. And um, um, distribute, uh, give them to the Vedanta Society, which had already been uh, started. And those were obviously used to make karma yoga. Now, uh, those uh, notes for uh, karma yoga, those, those transcripts of the classes, a copy was sent to Edward Sturdy in England, because uh, he had, was doing the Vedanta work there, and he was also teaching. And so for his use and edification, uh, the copies of the notes were sent to Sturdy. And Sturdy took it upon himself to publish them uh, without permission. And this caused a big uh, ruckus, a big argument, in the, because the New York Vedanta Society, they said, wait, but Swamiji, you gave us the exclusive rights to publish this, and we were going to publish it as Karma Yoga, and now he's gone ahead and published them. <laughs> so there was a big argument, and we are so lucky that he did that, because he published them almost unedited. They're almost unedited, so we get Swami Vivekananda's words practically as he spoke them in this, this karma yoga. And it, it's, it, I couldn't find it anywhere, but um, there was a copy in uh, the, um, uh, the Indian Institute of the Bodleian Library at Oxford. And, and Mary Louise Burke uh, made a copy of it. And I have a copy of that copy <laughs> with her notes in it. So uh, it's, a, it's a very rare book. But so I'm going to use this as the primary text for our study of karma yoga, uh, because it's practically, but, but I encourage you to bring, a, if you're going to follow the class, bring a book and 
or it's, it's online. You can even read it on your, on your device. Uh, so let's start now with the first beginner's class of, uh, for in Karma Yoga, delivered on December 13, 1896, in the afternoon or evening. I'm not sure what time it was. Um, we're not sure. Let, let me just paint this beautiful picture written by Sister Deva Mata, who was Laura Glenn at that time. It was a heterogeneous gathering at the classes in those shabby lodgings. Old and young, rich and poor, wise and foolish, stingy ones who dropped a button in the collection basket, and more generous ones who gave a dollar bill or even two, which is not a small amount in those days. We all met day after day and became friends without words or association. Some of us never missed a meeting. We followed the course on bhakti yoga and the course on jnana yoga. We walked simultaneously along the paths of raja yoga and karma yoga. We were almost sorry that there were only four yogas. We would have liked six or eight, that the number of classes might be multiplied. The faithful group that followed the Swami wherever he spoke were as relentless as they were earnest. If he suggested, tentatively, omitting a class because of a holiday or for some other reason, there was a loud protest always. This one had come to New York specially for the teaching and wished to get all she could. Another was leaving town soon and was unwilling to lose a single opportunity of hearing the Swami. They gave him no respite. He taught early and late. Among the most eager were a number of teachers, each with a blank book in hand, and the Swami's words were punctuated by the tap of their pencils taking rapid notes. <laughs> and of course, Goodwin at, at the back taking full and complete notes. Not a sentence went unrecorded, and I am sure that if later anyone had made the circuit of the New York centers of new thought, metaphysics, or divine science, they would have heard everywhere Vedanta and yoga in more or less diluted form. So this gives us a, a, a picture of these classes full of people hanging on to every word, and um, amongst them also some uh, people who were spiritual teachers in their own right. Uh, taking notes. And so here also we get a hint of the influence Swami Vivekananda had on spiritual movements in this country and how uh, New York was really the center of inte intellectual or, well, f certainly financial life. And also, I mean, it was, I guess he would say that Boston was the intellectual center, but uh, all these, uh, this new thought and this, it's the, that was the background of the New Age movement and all of that, which has been tremendously influential in this country. Uh, influenced by Swami Vivekananda. All those teachers were sitting at his feet, taking notes and then giving the teachings to, the, uh, teaching, to their, um, their own students. All right. So this first class is uh, called Karma in its effect on character. The word karma is derived from the Sanskrit kri, to do. All action is karma. Technically, this word also means sometimes the effect of actions. In connection with metaphysics, it sometimes means the effect of which our past actions were the causes. But in karma yoga, we have simply to do with the word karma as meaning work. OK, this is uh, a good place to uh, talk about uh, a little bit about karma. Karma now is a very common word. Oh, it's bad karma, <laughs> really bad karma. Or, oh, boy, I had some good karma. Uh, something, karma. huh? Instant karma. Instant karma, right. There's the, we, we, we. <laughs> so it's interesting how the word has really entered the lexicon now. Instant karma, someone, you do something bad, and instantly something bad happens to you. And this idea that, that our actions have, uh, have effects, not only immediate effects, like, um, you put your hand in the fire and you get burned, or you throw a stone at a, at a window and the window shatters. These are immediate effects. But if you do a negative action, the idea is that uh, that uh, sets the stage for some suffering to come upon us in the future. 
It's what's what comma? Accelerated. Accelerated. <laughs> So, well, I don't, I, I don't know if it all comes at once because uh, the, the tradition, uh, or the Vedantic tradition uh, holds that there are how, how many kinds of karma? Pop quiz? Five. Five? Well, I'm thinking of three, the, three main, the three main karma that, uh, as, as in the, the effects of past actions, there's... Prarabdha? That's the karma that has brought this present life about. What, what karma is unfolding in our life right now, the experiences of happiness and misery that we are getting in this life, that is a, a certain karma unfolding with certain actions we have done that are bearing fruits in this life in the form of joy, happiness, and misery, experiences of happiness and misery. There is also but, but, but by no means all the karma that we have uh, built up over the m many lifetimes we have lived, in the Vedantic uh, understanding at least, are manifesting in this life. So the whole mass of karma is called sanchita karma. The, the, that, uh, uh, and much of it perhaps is not manifesting in this life. It's just the prarabdha that's manifesting in, the life, in this life. And then there's also the karma yet to come, agami, that which we are do the things which we are doing now, which may bear fruit uh, in the future. Uh, so uh, about action, we know that here Swamiji says all action is karma. Now, there are different kinds of action. There's unconscious action. Our hearts are beating. That's a kind of action. But it's, it's not conscious, and it's not voluntary. But there's, uh, and there are also, we do unconscious things like um, somebody will be chewing his fingernails and, and somebody the, unconsciously, or um, tapping on the table. That's an action. People do it unconsciously. They're not thinking when they're maybe they're reading or something. Or, or people pe 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 people can even eat unconsciously. You know, watching TV and the hand is going like this to the bowl of popcorn and <laughs> unaware that you're actually eating. But. Uh, um, Conscious voluntary action is, of course, the most uh, relevant in our uh, practice of karma yoga. And the, res the results of karma that we're talking about, it's always, this is important to remember, it's always the karma determines the experience, our experience in this life of joy and misery. We have a, a, a combination of ex joy and misery in this life. There's no doubt about it. We all have misery. We all have joy. But it's evident that some people seem to have a preponderance of misery, and some people seem to have a preponderance of, of, of ple joy or of pleasant experiences. And some people have more painful experiences. Uh, how do you explain it? So the, the theory of karma of our past actions bearing fruit in, in this life is a credible explanation for the differences we see among people. It's, it's a credible explanation and, and a good theory. It's not, actually, it's not necessary for the practice of karma yoga to even accept this, this idea that um, uh, the, the pleasant and unpleasant experiences we have in this life are, are due to our past, ex past actions. But it may be a help, uh, helpful in some cases to understand our, our experiences that way. Um, we'll, have, we'll have a little time for discussion at the end, if that's OK. So um, where was I? <laughs> the, um, No, but let, let me back up a little bit then. Um, so uh, the results, uh, so we have the experience of, joy, of, of pleasant experiences and painful experiences uh, as a result of our actions. So the important, here we are, the important point, however, is that um, karma in, that, in the sense of the results of past actions does not determine our actions in this life. It only ex it determines our experience of pleasant 
and unpleasant of misery and uh, joy. It doesn't determine, well, it's my karma that I have to do this. No, that's not the karma. That's our, th th there we have a choice. We always have a choice how to act now. And that's where the power of karma yoga, because we can determine our, we have in our hands our future experience. We have in our hands the ability to mold our character. And how do we do it? Through karma yoga. This is the most powerful way of molding our character through uh, knowing how to work, knowing how to act. So let me let's go back to the text. In karma yoga, we have simply to do with the word karma as meaning work. The goal of all mankind, I'm going to do a little editing on the fly. The goal of all humankind is knowledge. That is the one ideal placed before us by the Eastern philosophy. Pleasure is not the goal of humanity, but knowledge. Pleasure and happiness come to an end. Okay, so let's, the, the, right, at the bat, right off the bat, he's reminding us what is the goal of karma yoga? What is the goal of all yoga? It is knowledge. What kind of knowledge? The supreme knowledge. The knowledge of who we truly are as uh, one with the infinite consciousness and bliss that is the very basis of this universe, the very basis of our being. And some, uh, we often confuse pleasure and joy. He reminds us pleasure is not the goal of humanity. Our goal is not pleasure. It is infinite bliss, which is different from pleasure. Pleasure comes and go. Pleasure and happiness, happiness which is, uh, happiness which is based on any limited thing in this world. I win the lottery, I am happy. That happiness will not last. That happiness will come to an end. I find the perfect spouse. I'm happy. That happiness will not last. <laughs> Those of you who are married for a long time, you know that. <laughs> it cannot last. Uh, but certainly, there is some happiness. It brings both, right? It brings both happiness and misery. And now here we see Swami Vivekananda is going to uh, touch on or hammer a little bit on those, uh, we call them the pairs of opposites, the dwandvas that this world, that we find in this world. We find pleasure is always accompanied by pain. Happiness is always accompanied by sorrow in this world. That's the very nature of this world, the pairs of opposites. So it's, uh, Swami Vivekananda is reminding us, pleasure is not the goal of humanity, but knowledge. Pleasure and happiness come to an end. It is a mistake that humankind makes to think that pleasure is the goal. That is the cause of all the miseries we have in the world. Remarkable statement. This mistake that pleasure is the goal is the cause of all the misery we have. We can think about that a little bit. Because human beings foolishly think that pleasure is the ideal. After a time, one finds that it is not happiness, but knowledge towards which we are going, and that both pleasure and pain are great teachers, that good as well as evil is a great teacher. As pleasure and pain pass before the soul, they leave upon it different pictures. And the result of these combined impressions is what is called a person's character. Okay, here he's, he's come up to this point of character right at the beginning, this importance of character. Character is formed uh, by uh, both pleasure and pain, both good and evil. All, all these are teachers. And as pleasure and pain pass before the soul, they leave upon it different pictures. And the result of these combined impressions is what is called a person's character. And he'll go on to say, uh, he, he says, let me read a little further. If you take the character of any person, 
It really is but the aggregate of tendencies, the complete sum of all the tendencies, the sum total of the bent of his or her mind. You will find that misery and happiness were equal factors in the formation of that character. Good and evil have had an equal share in the formation of character. And in some instances, misery is a greater teacher than happiness. And I think that's, that, that rings true for us. When we're happy, <laughs> Swami Swahanandaji, oh, the, the previous head of this center, uh, he often used to say, when you're happy, nobody asks, why me, when you're happy, right? When you're happy, everything's going well. You, 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 you have uh, uh, a good job and a good income and a happy family. And you, people don't say, well, why me? Why, why do I have such a happy, blessed life? It's only, when misery, it's only when misery comes that we say, why me? Why should this miserable thing happen to me? Why me, right? That's when we become ref reflective, when we start questioning, when we start seeking for something higher, when we, when we hit this experience of misery, when we find that as hard as we try to make everything in our life perfect and nice and happy, and it ought to be so simple, if I could just get the right boss and the right spouse and everything lined up right, I'd, I'd be happy. And yet we find that it's impossible. Again, misery comes. Then we start to question. So misery is the greater teacher than happiness. In studying the great characters that the world has produced, I dare say that in the vast majority of cases, it was misery that taught more than happiness. It was poverty that taught more than wealth. It was blows that brought out the fire rather than praise. And we see in Swami Vivekananda's own life how much he, uh, af when his father, up until his father died, his life was charmed. He was blessed with a very strong body and an ext extremely powerful mind. And uh, his father was a very wealthy man. Actually, he wasn't a wealthy man. He was a very high earning and high spending man who did not build up any wealth. He spent as freely as he earned. So he lived as a, a, a very comfortable life. And at the age of uh, nine, 18 or 19, his father suddenly died of a heart attack. No, n no provisions for the family, no pension, no savings. Uh, and he was thrown into dire poverty, and not enough to eat. Family was going hungry. Uh, he couldn't find a job. He really suffered. And this was part of his, uh, so he's speaking from experience that it was that experience which really brought out the fire in him. Now he's going to talk about knowledge, and we've talked about this so much in, in Vedanta. Um, where is uh, knowledge? Knowledge is, do we get knowledge from outside? Do we get knowledge from within? Now this knowledge, again, is inherent in, in a person. No knowledge comes from outside. It is all inside. What we say a person knows in strict psychological language should be what a person discovers or unveils. What a person learns, quote unquote, is really what a person discovers. The word discover meaning he takes the cover off of his own soul, which is a mine of infinite knowledge. Isn't this beautiful? Here we get, this line is edited in the uh, Complete Works version, uh, this, this idea that the word discover, meaning to uncover, to remove the, to remove the cover. Cover, there's a cover, and you, you diss that cover, discover. The word means he takes or she takes the cover off of her own soul, which is a mine of infinite knowledge. The soul is a mine of infinite knowledge. Our true nature is, uh, is a mine of infinite knowledge. And when we learn something, when we discover something, we are simply taking the cover off of our own true self, and there uh, the knowledge arises. We say Newton discovered gravitation. Was it sitting anywhere in a corner waiting for him? It was in his own mind. And the time came, and he found it out. All knowledge that the world has ever received comes from the mind. The infinite library of the universe is in your own mind. The external world is simply the suggestion, 
the occasion which sets you to study your own mind. But the object of your study is always your own mind. OK, this is not quite um, intuitive. Uh, we think, well, no, I, I study. Uh, I go to school. I study psychology. I study the books. What did Freud say? What did um, Jung say? What did the later teachers say? And you start to uh, get knowledge from books and from study. Um, This is, uh, Sri Ramakrishna <laughs> wasn't much a fan of, of uh, uh, book learning either. He, his, he would put it that the mother provides everything. Uh, from the devotional standpoint, uh, Sri Ramakrishna, he, he would speak unendingly. He had a, a seemingly infinite store of wisdom and stories and, and, uh, to share with his disciples. And he would say, it's like the grain sellers. When the grain sellers are weighing out grain, they, they have a small amount of grain and they're weighing it. But uh, they need a little more. The, the assistant behind, there's a huge heap of, of grain, of rice back there. And they just push, push it forward. They push it forward more, and they weigh it, and they give it. And a mother is like that. She, she's, she keeps pushing the, the knowledge. I don't know anything. Mother provides everything. So that's a, a different way of saying the same thing that the infinite storehouse of knowledge is actually within us. The falling of an apple gave the suggestion to Newton, and he studied his own mind. He re-read all the previous links of his mind and discovered a new link among them, which we call the law of gravitation. It was not the apple or anything in the center of the earth. So all knowledge secular or spiritual, is in the human mind. Interesting. Not only spiritual knowledge, but even secular knowledge is in the human mind. True. Well, how can it be anywhere else? Because it is, well, knowledge means that which, when we understand, when we, we, are, we grasp it with our conscious mind, then we call it knowledge, right? So it, how can it be in a book? <laughs> it has to be arising in our minds. Now, sometimes a book may help us to uncover that, to, to realize it, to understand it. In many cases, it is not discovered, but remains covered. And when the covering is being slowly taken off, we say, we are learning. And the advance of knowledge is made by the advance of this process of discovering. It's interesting. I, I don't think I fully understood yet uh, why Swami Vivekananda is spending so much time on knowledge at the beginning of karma yoga. We, uh, karma yoga, we think of it, well, shouldn't you be talking about action? How do we act? But he's not. He's giving a good amount of time on, we, 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 should, we should say that this, shouldn't this be part of jnana yoga, this discussion of knowledge? Because uh, that's the yoga of wisdom, of, of not, that's the yoga of knowledge, of wisdom. And why is he talking about knowledge so much at the beginning of Karma Yoga. Let's read further and find out. The person from whom this veil is being lifted is the more knowing person. The person upon whom it lies thick is ignorant. And the person from whom it has gone entirely away is the all-knowing, the omniscient. There have been omniscient persons, and I believe will be yet, and that there will be myriads in the cycles to come. OK, omniscience, the all-knowing. Uh, there's a Sanskrit term, sarvavid, knowing all. What does it mean? How can we know all? Sometimes the, the question comes up. If say, we call someone sarvavid, generally, we, generally then we're referring to someone who is spiritually illumined, is all-knowing. Does it mean that if you ask such a person, say, we, f we meet a, a great saint who has attained omniscience, and we ask her, uh, oh, so you're omniscient? What are the quantum mechanics equations? Can you tell, tell me that? Will she be able to rattle off the quant quantum mechanics equations? Or if we say, what is the chemical composition of uh, mm, this bottle of uh, lotion? <laughs> <laughs> Will he be able to do it? So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that kind of 
uh, that kind of omniscience. I think we go back to the question asked in the Mundaka Upanishad, which is, what is that by knowing which everything is known? What is that by knowing which everything is known? This is the question that the disciple asks the teacher at the beginning of the Mundaka Upanishad, and the rest of the Upanishad is uh, talking about uh, he st starts out by teaching that there's a lower knowledge and there's a higher knowledge. And the lower knowledge is everything uh, 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 that we've talked about, including quantum mechanics equations and all that. And the higher knowledge, it, that is the knowledge by which everything is known. Uh, it, the, the knowledge by, because we know the essence of everything. Knowing everything in this sense means uh, we know the true nature the true nature of this book is not a book. The true nature of this book is Satchit Ananda. It is a, a simply a manifestation or a reflection of infinite consciousness and bliss. And the, the all-knowing one knows that. So knows the, 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 the highest truth of it. What the book contains, of course, Swami Vivekananda could just, re, just read a book like this. <laughs> <laughs> and understand it, but that's another, that's another matter. That was his uh, intense concentration, his powers of mind had been so fully developed. So this omniscience, uh, the knower, uh, uh, this world is seemingly infinite. And the, uh, as a kid, I also it used to strike me that how can you know everything? There's so many, so many different fields of knowledge. And the more, w the, the more we learn, the more we realize how much there is to know and how we can't possibly know and how little actually we know. And the more further we study, the more the narrower and narrower and narrower our field of knowledge becomes, the, the, the more specialized becomes. The, 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 those who have had uh, just a, a, um, a high school education, they have a general knowledge of a wide things. Now you go to college, well, you select a major, and so someone is going to major in psychology, and so it becomes narrowed down. And then well, they'll go for a master's degree, and it gets narrowed down to a particular branch of psychology, like cognitive psychology or behavioral psychology. And then they go for a PhD, and it's, it goes narrower and narrower and narrower. So uh, that kind of omniscience is, is uh, actually not omniscience, because it's uh, it's always going to be limited. It's knowing that by which everything is known, our true self. Like fire in a piece of flint, knowledge exists in the mind. Friction is the suggestion that brings out that fire. So with all our actions, our tears and our smiles, our joys and our sorrows, our weeping and laughter, our curses and our blessings, our praises and our blames. With every one of them, we find in the long run, if we calmly study our own selves, that they have been brought out by so many blows. The result is what we are. All these blows taken together are called karma, work, action. tries to give us this, this full picture. Uh, he, get, he gets very rhetorical. And uh, the, the, this, uh, these pairs of opposites, I love the way he, our, our joys and sorrows, our weeping and laughter, these all, they, they come together, our curses and blessings, our praises and blames. Hmm? With every one of them, we find in the long run, they have been brought out by so many blows. The result is what we are. All these blows taken together are called karma, work, action. Every mental and physical force that impinges upon the soul, by which, as it were, fire is struck from it, by which its own power and knowledge are discovered, is karma, the word being used in its universal sense. So we are doing karma all the time. I am talking to you, that is karma. You are listening, that is karma. We breathe, that is karma. We walk, karma. We talk, karma. Everything we do, physical or mental, is karma. And 
is leaving its marks on us. Okay, here he comes up to this important point, which might be a good stopping point. Uh, everything, basically he's driving home now. When we talk about karma, it really means all action. Not just actions with our hands or actions with our uh, bodies, uh, but speech. We have the prayer in, in, at the end of the Homa, the beautiful prayer that we do. I, who am an embodied being, endowed with life, breath, intellect, and their functions, now offer up all my actions and their fruits to the fire of Brahman. No matter what I may have done, said, or thought with my mind, my tongue, my hands, all the, my, my whole, all the organs of my body, may all this be an offering unto the Supreme. That prayer we do, that covers all action. It's, it's body, speech, and mind is often how it's uh, these, these three, body, speech, and mind. No, we don't go to the bar next day. Um, 